<clears throat> All right. Well, happy Friday, everyone. Rich Swarbinski with the Mortgage Collaborative here once again with the rundown with Rob and Rich, where we take you into the weekend, recapping the week that was in the mortgage industry. And as always, pleased to be joined by my co-host, Rob Crisman. Rob, good to see you. Good to see you, too. You're not going to virtually bitch slap me if I uh, make fun of your six decades in the industry or your love of edibles or the Draymond Green nut punch that brought Cleveland its first title, are you? Did you uh, spend all week putting that list together, Rich? Uh, <laughs> no, I won't, uh, I, won't, I won't do anything. I'll just sit here in silence and take it all. All right. After, you know, the Oscars, I just wanted to make sure there was no, you know, hidden hostility between, uh, you know, the, the co-hosts here. Will, Will Smith hit the, uh, hit the right rock. I'll tell you that. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's a good, that's a good one. Yeah. If he would have hit the rock, it might have ended different. So, <laughs> and this week, once again, uh, pleased to be joined in the co-host chair by the president of ACC Mortgage, Robert Sanko. Robert, good to see you. Magic hands like Rob. So. <laughs> ACC just experienced their first TMC conference, relatively new TMC preferred partner. We've been looking for a good partner in the non-QM space for quite some time, as Robert can attest. I had been all over him like a bad rash for about nine months trying to trying to get on his radar, just based on what we'd heard for our members and um, just, you know, your guys steady as a rock approach to non-QM and the good experience a lot of our members were having with you guys. So how was your first TMC conference? You know, I, I got to tell you, the, the crowd was just warm, embracing, very friendly, very productive, um, not just to me, but to my team. Like it, it was, you know, as you said, you've been chasing me for a while and talking about these conferences. And it just felt very comfortable. Like these were, you know, 10, 20 year friendships. Um, very easy, very approachable. So I, it really, I'm looking forward to Chicago already. Yeah, we try to create a different vibe. We're very selective, not only on our members, but our partners and heard a lot of good things about you and ACC as well. And so, yeah, really looking forward to the partnership and uh, having somebody we can, we can kind of send our members to and uh, work with and, and what's going to be certainly an emerging part of the market and certainly a bigger piece of the pie as we get into 22 and beyond. Rich, uh, if, if TMC, so how, did, how, how am I on this call if you're selective? Did I, <laughs> did I, did, did I get in under the, <laughs> under the bar somehow? You, you were grandfathered into like uh, the Volcker rule back in the seventies. Uh, there's some fine oh, yeah. print that allowed you to slip through the cracks. So but uh, let's go ahead and get into it. And uh, Rob, it's like, I, I, you know, you're, I always love your April 1st newsletter, which is hysterical. But I found myself thinking today as I was reading the real news headlines, like it's really hard to decipher, you know, what, what is real and what is potentially a spoof April 1st news headline. You got the Dallas Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve coming out and, and formally you know, really talking about their fears of a housing bubble in America, something we've been talking about for a while. You got the government getting in the appraisal business. You got the president of the Philly Federal Reserve coming out today and saying he thinks the 40-year fixed rate mortgage is a good thing. You got an inverted yield curve. Like, I mean, these it's like fake news almost, but it's real news. It's been really a surreal start to the year. Yeah, it's something. Um, can't, you know, truth being stranger than fiction, right? There's, there's a lot of interesting things going on and things that lenders have to contend with, which are really something. I don't know. <clears throat> there are a lot of companies that really kind of toy with the ability to repay requirements and so forth. I don't think a 40-year mortgage is necessarily against the law. Certainly adjustable rate mortgages aren't against the law, just like uh, well-structured partnerships and joint ventures aren't, aren't against the law. So the, the environment that lenders are facing right now with, with the potential of rates going up more and with diminishing margins and diminishing volumes is trying to keep the manufacturing plant that they've created supplied with mortgages. And whether, that's, whether those are bond programs or down payment assistance programs to help their borrowers, 40-year mortgages, whatever, as long as it fits within compliance guidelines, then 
you know, have at it. The, a lot of the easy fruit has been, quote, plucked from the trees already. And so lenders are dealing with looking at some of the pro products that may have been sitting on their shelves, gathering dust for a year or two now that volumes are down. So I don't, I don't uh, blame, blame lenders for, for looking at things like four-year mortgages or looking at some of these programs, like I said, that, that haven't been so active recently. So yeah, it's good. And, and borrowers need, need help to one degree or another, assuming they can find a house to buy. They are looking at products that may have been, um, may not have been so mainstream over the last few years because it was so easy to do Fannie Freddie, FHA, VA, throw in a little USDA and throw in some jumbo, throw in some non-QM, which I'm sure Robert will talk about. And now a lot of those programs, while still there, lenders are, are broadening their reach a little bit as to be expected. And Robert, I, one, of the, one of the rules of a qualified mortgage is 30 years max, right? So does that make, uh, I guess, a four, Fannie and Freddie tried to do a 40 year mortgage. It was like 10 years ago. And I think at the time, a lot of people thought it, it had some legs, but it ended up having no legs and not a lot of demand in the secondary market. Uh, that's something you guys think about, talk about in, in your world? You know, it, you, it's like I said earlier, like everything that's old is new again. So these conversations resurface. And every time, you know, affordability and, you know, trying to get more people in the homes, these conversations pop up. So, you know, this, this is all fresh and new. It makes sense on a lot of levels. Uh, you know, there's nothing, you know, currently in the works, but it makes sense because these, you know, rates have spiked up and will continue to do so. So we're going to look for, you know, these new tools. Arms are going to be coming back. You know, that's just on the horizon, you know, as the, the market settle to make it more affordable, as Rob touched on. Um, so it, it's you're going to see a lot of for uh, for, you know, people like Rob and yourself and myself who've been in this. We're going to start seeing those same conversations again. And, you know, as non-QM is going to grow as a market share, you know, the ability to qualify more people is going to be the, you know, forefront of how do we do that and how do we get more people in the homes, assuming they can find them. Right. You know, I should, let's just, let's just, let's just talk about the elephant in the room, Robert. The, uh, the Angel Oak announcement yesterday, I received uh, an email today from Angel Oak saying they have uh, reversed that announcement and, and unfortunately wow. fortunately it came came to me after my commentary went out and i thought about putting out a special announcement because the the non-qm sector doesn't need to be roiled r-o-i-l-e-d and so angel oak going back to the way their lock policy was was certainly welcome and will be welcome but the the, the attribution to a volatile market is, tell us what's going on in the, in the non-QM capital market space that would make companies, I'm not gonna mention that one anymore by name, but make companies change their lock policy or impact their ability to execute in the capital markets. That's a big question. And, uh, you know, I, I'm by no means a capital market expert. In fact, I'm, I, I jokingly call myself a glorified loan officer because, you know, I, I try to keep things, you know, very simple in our approach. You know, fortunately, our hedging and locking strategy, we have honored all our locks and will continue and we'll have a policy to honor those. There'll be a cost if we go beyond our 30 days, which is typical in market. So I was surprised by that uh, Angel Oak tact. I, I guess my sense is, and this is my theory, is you know a lot of non-QM lenders got caught off sides in this rising rate environment. They didn't hedge properly, and there's a lot of pain out there. And you know, again, not naming names, but there's a lot of companies that their first quarter 
is going to be rough. You you had a, a post uh, where someone was looking to sell a non-QM lender, um, you know, put it basically themselves out to market. And my sense is, and again, I don't know who the company is, and I would love to talk to them, is they probably got a, a couple bad trades. They were locking. They didn't think the market was going to get away from them. And instead of making profit on their sales and executions, they lost money. So that hits their balance sheet. Now they're going to have covenant issues, I would suspect, with their their warehouse lenders. And, uh, you know, the only way to fix that is more money and or, you know, be acquired or merged with a company. So there's a lot of pain and it, it shocks me every time we go through these companies don't prepare for the rainy days. And I, and I guess, you know, in my 26 years of being self-employed and I haven't seen it all going back to the long-term capital management, you know, the ruble crisis in 98, 99, I saw a lot of good companies go out overnight when they didn't properly lock or execute. They went from looking to make money to, you know, you know, having to reach in their pocket and that effectively wiped them out. So uh, I'm surprised. I assume with Angel Oak that they were offsides in their hedging strategy and whoever, you know, head of their capital markets didn't see this rate rise and didn't properly protect themselves. And they're an excellent company. So I don't want to, you know, uh, schadenfreude and their uh you know misery um it's surprising that they took that approach in this whipsaw um after the fact you know without going through i i, I question you know them really debating that and, and moving forward you know how they're doing that and even in the the chat box here someone says well now they're down to only a 15-day lock which really you know in the non-qm world you need you need a full 30 days to kind of get those through so you know they're basically saying float for for two weeks and then as you get closer lock and that's you know that's dangerous because you're going to have some very upset borrowers if you come in on the first of the month i you know i suspect if we come back here may one we're going to have a rising rate and and i think everybody anticipates that so you've got to move quick lock and execute so there there's going to be some you know some consolidation in the non-qm space and some pain and you know and you hear the same rumbles and i don't want to you know give oxygen to rumors that i don't know you know the angel oak is out there for all you know public consumption and i think that's you know that's going to be the challenge much like you know fanny freddie you know you have a rising rate and that's where non-qm traditionally has been a very level you know gradual increase and you know you know, decrease, you know, it doesn't have these wild fluctuations that we've experienced over the last essentially 10 weeks. Well, the, you raise a lot of issues. I'm going to, I'm going to put on my capital markets beanie with the propeller and say, and, and repeat for, for those in the, in the viewer, in the viewing audience today who were there in Miami Mark and I were up there talking about capital markets issues and really there's no, there's not a lot of black box stuff, I think, or maybe I'm just used to it with regard to capital markets. The trick with capital markets is to do the same boring thing consistently every day and not to, not to think, well, I think rates are going to go up or I think rates are going to go down or somebody out there is, is predicting interest rates are going to do whatever it's, it's, they take their locks and they hedge their locks and they do it the next day and the next day and the next day. And so I, I would assume, you know, there are some very, very talented companies in the non-QM space and talented individuals in those companies and talented capital markets people. I would, I personally would be a little bit surprised if that, capital market, those capital markets people in any company are, are taking a speculative position because that just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't, it's not a recipe for success. It's not, it's not a good thing to do. And in fact, as a quick note here, we're going a little bit, we're diverging from, I'm sure what Rich wants to talk about, but it's important for owners and CEOs out there to compensate their capital market staff based on not taking chances. You don't want your capital markets person thinking, oh my God, I want to buy a new Escalade. 
this autumn. So I better start gambling a little bit with the company's money and taking some chances because I'm being compensated on, you know, some kind of prof profitability per se. The, the role of the capital markets is to protect the margins that are built into the rate sheet pricing and, and not diverge too much from those. So that's what, that's why it pays to be very consistent. So hopefully anybody out there isn't really taking, you know, taking chances with their pipeline, taking chances with their company's future based on, you know, whatever it is. It's just, just you just have to do the same thing day in and day out. So yeah, Robert, to your point, I was a little bit surprised the, uh, 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 when they, when they talked about volatility, I, I didn't know that the non-QM sector was seeing any more volatility than the QM sector with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and so forth. Obviously, hedging non-QM loans are a little are different than hedging Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and FHA VA loans, where you can hedge with Fannie, or I should say, you know, UMBS, Fannie Mae Securities, Freddie Mac Securities, or Ginnie Mae Securities. Non-QM, the hedging mechanism or the hedging vehicles tend to be a little bit different. But nonetheless, the discipline and the consistency are the same. So it'll be interesting to see. I'm glad. I'm glad Angel Oak came back and said we're we're good on this. We're we're going to recant uh, our change the the change that we made yesterday. And uh, I think that's good for the industry because, like I said earlier, the last thing we as an industry need is another March and April of 2020 when so many companies, private label security companies, you know, ran for the exits and lenders and brokers were left hanging high and dry with, with their pipelines. Including well, I also our, think that part of, part of the issue is the securitization market. So I think the buyers demanded more and that's what really cramped down. So even with the best of hedging strategies, you know, that final exit, I think is what created a lot of pain points, you know, with non-QM as well. So again, I'm not the capital markets expert. Sorry to cut you off, Rich. No, we, I was just going to say we had one non-QM partner before and, um, you know, it was two weeks after the pandemic hit in March of 2020, the day it kind of gotten out of the market. <clears throat> and uh, that's why we were really selective this time around uh, when we were kind of assessing candidates. And uh, again, kind of always kept coming back to ACC with just uh, how long you guys have been doing it, your commitment to the market. And because, uh, you know, to be honest, that has been an impediment to some lenders uh, is just a lot of the moving parts and the people that are buying the loans and maybe not the best experiences they've had. So very, very important to do your due diligence uh, when picking an, a, a, a partner and a buyer in the non-QM space. And, and that space is going to be a much bigger part of the pie as we as we move forward here. So and, and Robert, something you need to remember is very important for you to remember. Don't ever apologize for cutting off Rich when he's talking because otherwise you or I will never get a word in it. Exactly. You gotta take your chances when you, you get just, up you know, put a quarter in, watch him go. There, I gotta hit that mark. Fair point. Thank you. <laughs> This is The Rundown with Rob and Rich. I'm Rich Swarbinski with The Mortgage Collaborative, joined as always by Rob Crisman. And this week, the president of ACC Mortgage, Robert Senko, and uh, a lot of notes in the chat about the 40-year mortgage, mostly people making fun of it and saying it's a bad idea, arms, um, and uh, some of the recent uh, turmoil and uh, we've seen in the secondary market on the non-QM side. And uh, somebody also sending a note to Rob, uh, reminiscing about the days of, uh, you know, and we talked about this on stage in, in Miami, like one cap markets person can take down an entire organization. I, I remember being a young capital markets guy, 25, 26 years old. And I remember at times thinking, I can't believe this bank has trusted me with this much responsibility. I, I did not that I wasn't ready for it, but it, it's, it, it, you know, cause it was around that 07, 08 time. It was, that was, I was a, in my mid twenties, early 20s, mid 20s cap markets got during that time. It was terrifying. And, and it, it really, it trained my brain to be fairways and greens and, and really right down the center and to not take any risks. So right. Ironically, the exact opposite of my stock market investment strategy uh, currently. So, Well, we'll get to that in a few minutes, Rich, but you, you bring up, what, what, once again, another good point. And that is, yeah, they, that bank trusted you or lenders, and investors and banks, credit unions and so forth, 
trust their capital market staff, but the capital market staff, whether or not you're using an outside hedging service, has to have the controls and the policies and procedures in place to basic, basic trade checkout procedures that, that can go a long way with eliminating a lot of, a lot of risk. And the, the, the example that I gave at the conference was, yeah, this, this capital markets person was, was executing trades and checking out his own trades, which is a mistake, and then putting the trade conference in his desk, thinking that the market was going to go one way. It, yeah, drove the company out of business. So having, having the correct policies and procedures in place, whether it's in capital markets or anything, with regard to, you know, underwriters are looking at files and there's all kinds of checks and balances that are going on out there. So, but capital markets, especially, there's a lot of leverage and one, one bad trade can take down a company. It doesn't take long. So let's talk about something more optimistic and fun. The, the Dallas Fed calling for a housing bubble, that more optimistic for you? <laughs> I think Rob froze. Wow, I really terrified. <laughs> Jesus. Well, Rich... The, the importance of sunscreen in, uh, in Fort Lauderdale with uh, TMC uh, management. Or no, we probably shouldn't talk about sunscreen. that. Right I, you know, I, I take sun well, aggressively. So, um, but uh, we, yeah, the Dallas Fed, we got to get into this. I mean, in, you know, I, what the Dallas Fed, this is the first federal entity that has come out and said, what we've been saying that for a long time. Nobody is calling for a repeat of what happened in 07, 08. There's fundamentals that are much stronger in the housing market that are going to prevent that. But I think what the Dallas Fed is saying is that a lot of factors right now have contributed to a troubling situation in housing that is likely or very possible to lead to an increased aggressive run-up in home prices, up 30% the last two years, on pace to be another 20% this year, would be 50% appreciation in three years. That will cause a correction that is somewhat unhealthy um, and not one that will bring, you know, the U.S. economy to its knees like like we saw in 07 and 08. So, uh, uh, Rob and Robert, I'd love your guys perspective on this new story, which is a big, big news story this week. I'm going to we've been doing all the talking. I'm going to turn this over to Robert so I can just say, <laughs> yeah, I agree with Robert. <laughs> Perfect. You know, I don't have that same fear of a housing bubble. Yes, there has been appreciation, but unlike 07, 08, that was an over leverage market. That was caused by over leverage. You know, in this, you know, just speaking from the non-QM, I mean, our weighted average loan to value is below 80%. You've got a lot of skin in the game in the housing. I mean, so sure, people are buying, there's a lot of cash buyers um, so I, I don't see that bubble. I think it's just a reallocation of funds out of the stock market that people have put into. And there's a greater appreciation. I think the pandemic made a greater appreciation for second homes, primary homes, you know, and the, and the value of, you know, home ownership. You know, as, when you're stuck in your home, you better darn well like where you are. So I don't have a fear of that, this housing bubble of anything remotely uh, of 07, 08. And I believe with the, the recent run up in the, in the rates is going to tamper things down. I, I think it's going to normalize the market. So you're not going to see this, you know, crazy appreciation. So I don't have that same fear. You know, those guys are a little smarter than me, but I, I don't live in fear of that, you know, it, and again, from a lending standpoint, you're not seeing the 95, certainly not 100%. Um, if anything, there's maybe just a little bit of tightening at the, at the higher bandwidth and the 90% range we still offer it, but you know, they're pricing for that. So you're tampering down a lot of that between the, the rates and not going aggressively. We're still looking for, you know, that skin in the game. So I, I don't have that same fear. I don't share that with the Dallas Fed. Rob, you what? What, Rich? You just said you agree. I, I, I do agree. Um, but, but, but I'm sitting here thinking the Dallas Fed has a lot more economists and actuarials and MBAs and PhDs scampering around on their staff that, than I do on mine. The, 
The fact of the matter is the, the lending environment is different. The fact of the matter is 14 years ago, we didn't have the supply and demand imbalance that we have now. So you're right. When you look back at whether it's a tulip bulb crisis or, or whatever it might be, whatever irrational exuberance has taken place, you could say that this, this market right now for housing is irrationally exuberant. But it's, it's I, you know, when I talk to friends, for example, and they say, well, what, you know, are we going to get into a housing, are we in a housing bubble? And, uh, and is, is the market going to go down? And I say, well, you know, it might, you know, if affordability becomes an issue and, and interest rates continue to go up and, and companies can't, or I should say individuals can't afford the payment, then the demand for housing may drop a little bit. But when I say that, my friends inevitably say, well, yeah, I want, I want to buy another house. I want, I want, we want a vacation home. We want the place near the seashore or on the lake. So there's this demand up there, this pent up demand, and there's a lot of cash. There's still a lot of cash out there with individuals and with parents of, of people who want to be first time home buyers and can't quite get there because they keep getting outbid. Now, whether 20 bids or 10 bids for a house goes down to two or three bids, well, okay, you still have two or three bids. And so the market right now is, is very strong. I just don't see, when I, I looked at the Fed report and there's a lot of you know, coulds, a lot of mays, a lot of possiblies and so forth. Nothing, nothing's definitive with regard to the future anytime, right? But really the, the environment is, is still very good and, and the, the credit is strong with a lot of borrowers and the ability to repay is much stronger than it was. And I do think, however, that it's unsustainable to see this kind of house price appreciation, especially that much higher than wage growth, that much higher than the, some of the consumer price level uh, inflation or producer price level inflation that we're seeing out there. So I would think that it's going to slow, but it's still, a, it's still a very healthy market. And Rich, I, I still, you know, in my travels, I still fail to see many for sale signs anywhere. No, I mean, I agree. And there, there's no definition of a bubble. And, and, and to be clear, I'm not calling for, you know, some crazy, crazy reversal anytime soon. I think you guys have outlined very well why there is still very, very strong demand for housing in America, but but no answer to the supply issues. And I guess the way I envision things playing out is homes to appreciate another 20% at least this year for that to carry through the spring buying market of next year, where we'll see another 15 to 20% annualized appreciation rate. And we're going to be sitting at a point where we'll have seen homes appreciate 50, 50 some percent over the course of three years. And then if you inflation, stocks, our mutuals are challenged right now. Um, it, it could create an environment where it could make, you know, once you have stock that is out there, the limited stock gets bought up mostly by the high end, haves and have nots, where you could see a pretty sharp reversal on the demand side without still any really ails to the supply side. And uh, you could see a pretty sharp reversal. I mean, you know, and so I guess that's my projection is another 20% this year, 20% through middle of next year, and then to lose about 20% in, in the year to follow that. <clears throat> it's, it, I think it's important <clears throat> for folks on the call or anybody to pay attention to the statistics because a lot of companies out there, and I shouldn't say companies, a lot of publications, if, if housing prices went up 20% this or last year and go up 15% this year, the headline, you know, the attention grabbing headline will say something like house price appreciation plummets. And, you know, going from 20% to 15%, is that really a plummet? I think a lot of the financial press is watching for some kind of crack in the appreciation. So just, just with regard to watching statistics and so forth, 
keep in mind, it's important to read the details. I think, you know, you can't go up 30% forever. No tree grows to the moon, as they say. The, uh, the, the appreciation has to slow to some, at some extent at some point. But, you know, I just, I just think that to, going back to Robert's points, which were spot on, it's a different borrower who are in the homes now. It's not the gardener who was earning $10 an hour and suddenly became a, uh, you know, owner of a gardening company and they were making $20,000 a month on some stated income program. The, the $10 an hour gardener now is having to prove their income. And, and Robert, I think, you know, non-QM talking about gardeners and, you know, the kind of borrower that may fit into that non-QM bucket, you know, the gardener is self-employed. Uh, Rob Chrisman, self-employed. Isn't that, isn't that the sweet spot for, for the products that ACC offers? That's a beautiful segue. Yeah, I mean, the, the stated, uh, the, the self-employed market is growing, you know, through the pandemic, you know, people took on side hustles, and they become their main hustles. And, you know, there's a lot of cash, they've made cash, they're being tax savvy and how they're filing their taxes. But they've got these healthy businesses and cash flowing businesses that can support their lifestyle, their homes, and the affordability. So, you know, it is, you know, represents probably about 40% of our business is for the self-employed. And for those gardeners and, you know, the heavy cash um, industries and people that, you know, how they're financing and taking in money, they're, they're very cash heavy. And they want to, you know, have that home ownership, and they're putting down large chunks of money. You, you stole my quote. Uh, I was thinking that as you're saying, you know, no trees grow to the sky. But another one is nothing cures high prices like high prices. You know, so at some point, you know, the affordability, the ability to put enough money down and get it, and people just stay away. You know, they'll just not go buy the new car, buy a house, buy anything. You know, it just. You, you can't keep continually rising. And you talk about, you know, people having cash and money. It, you know, when you pump in $8 trillion through over the last couple of years because of COVID, that money's going elsewhere. So there was, a, you had to have inflation. This shouldn't surprise anybody, whether it's home price, fuel, everything it is just going up. And that money's got to work its way through the system. So they pumped in all this money and it's going to cost you. It's going to cost all of us. And that's the only way, you know, for the, you know, the government to collect more taxes in the coffers. And, you know, so they, they gave that money. It's like going to the casino. You may win at one point on the table, but you're eventually going to give it back. And I think that's what's going to happen over the next couple of years. And, you know, in tax policy, um, inflation is going to be, it's a tax of sorts. Um, for everybody, you know, it, it doesn't discriminate at the pumps, at the grocery store and, and the home price. But at some point, you do get that leveling off and we'll, we'll draw back. This is The Rundown with Rob and Rich. I'm Rich Swarbinski with the Mortgage Collaborative, joined as always by Rob Crisman and this week, the president of ACC Mortgage, Robert Senko. Uh, some other stuff in the news these last couple of weeks, federal home loan banks uh, coming under attack by some people in Congress that uh, really wanting Congress to take a closer look at them, basically saying that they enjoy the same, you know, government umbrella that Fannie and Freddie do without any of the scrutiny. Me personally, you know, being a community banker, I, I mean, community banks got enough challenges to originating mortgages and having that outlook with the federal home loan banks to me is a great thing for them that, that helps overcome some of the crap they got to deal with that independent mortgage banks don't. But uh, I don't know, Rob, Robert, any, any thoughts when you saw that story this week? Robert? I, you know, it's, it's out of my purview. I think, you know, that backing, you know, from what I understand of, you know, community banking. And when I looked at buying a bank many years ago, I mean, that's a major lifeline. You, you need that. So I, to me, it sounds like much ado of nothing. Yeah. John, John Pogovich just posted a comment that, that makes sense. I mean, they're, they're a great partner and it's almost as if uh, this is going to sound very, very negative, but 
sometimes I think regulators and politicians, when when they don't have anything to talk about, somebody will raise an issue and they will carry that issue forward just to get some headlines and just to show their constituents possibly coming up on an election that they are, you know, let's look at those mean federal home loan banks. You know, there's, there's, there's some smoke there. There must be fire there. And it, it can be for no particular reason. The, the, they're, they're a great partner as John mentioned. So the, in the chat. So, yeah, I, I see that as kind of stirring the pot and not having a lot of substance there, frankly, just my two cents. Yeah, negative connotations with banks. And, you know, a lot of it is some of the, the big bank headlines of 07, 08 and, and beyond. But it, it always killed me as a community banker. I remember being a community banker after 07, 08 and being at cocktail parties, not industry. And, you know, people would ask me what I did for a living. It was like, man, I felt guilty. Like I felt like I was uh, the scarlet letter. Uh, saying I worked for a bank and I worked for a great community bank that, that was doing a lot of great things for people. So just a crazy byproduct of these last 15 years. Um, also in the news this week, just this morning, another good jobs report this morning, you know, and that is kind of the, the, the one thing that, it, I mean, really it, this roaring job market has been the lifeline of an economy that has been under peril in so many ways, if it's inflation or wars or uh, our part to it, uh, housing being a challenge to people. The jobs numbers just keep looking strong. The, the new jobs number missed by a little bit for the most recent month in March, but the January and February revisions were so high that was viewed as positive. The unemployment rate now at 3.6%, if you remember, just before the pandemic, it hit 3.5, which was the 50-year low, and we're very, very close to that. Uh, without the, you know, uh, participation rates, uh, you know, non-labor participation rates going through the roof. So very, very strong housing market, Robert. And it sounded like you kind of alluded to that when you talked about just what you're looking at and the deals that you guys are underwriting. It's a very strong job market right now. Well, to me, that that's the great driver. You know, with with so much negativity and raising rates and everything we talk about, it's incredible. I mean, we're at 52 year lows with these job numbers. I mean, and if people are employed, that's good for the economy. And, and people talk about inflation and we're going into a recession. Again, I'm not, I'm not an economist and I don't, I, I just don't feel it. You know, if people are employed, you know, they're earning money, they're spending money. I mean, it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of positivity. Yeah, it's going to be more expensive for all the reasons we touched on. But, you know, when people are employed and you look everywhere, you, you could fill every restaurant, every, you know, you go to the malls, you go to the stores, home day, they're looking for people. So there's just, you know, so much yeah. demand for employment. That's, to me, the great driver of everything. And that should be applauded and appreciated. I, I think that's the positive news uh, of the day and of the year. I, I agree. The you, you can't can't go in a restaurant. I mean, I almost turned in my job application at Trader Joe's this morning. I mean, the, the, these these supermarkets and these stores and these restaurants are crying out for people. It's and and you know what's going to happen, of course, is that <clears throat> we'll see wage inflation in order to attract the service workers. In which case. You know the price of your burrito is going to go up. It's already gone up. It's crazy, the price of food and, and liquor, and especially liquor. I, I that hits my bottom line nightly. So I heard uh, you've had to increase your ad rates, Rob, in your newsletter just because of your liquor consumption bills going through the roof. I'm sorry. <laughs> Were you on mute? Were you on mute, Rich? I didn't catch that. I saw you your lips moving. That was my source was you on that. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, to your point, I, I was in, did the show Friday from four. I was in Fort Lauderdale for a week after our show. You, it, you could not get in the restaurants. They were packed and every single one of them was understaffed. We had a group of six with us. I could not get out of a restaurant for less than $250. And we were going to sports bars 
And, you know, like I, the, it is great. The cost of food, you know, is and really people, and, and people are spending. They people, are. It was packed, right? It Regardless packed. of the cost. Yeah, absolutely. So, but, you know, but inside the labor report this morning, uh, hospitality and leisure was up huge. I think it was up 112,000 new jobs or something, the biggest increase and not surprisingly but still probably some more help needed there but uh again you know we we took so much of the news that we've covered on on this show has been negative stuff related to housing obviously it's our bailiwick but uh the one strong positive underlier has been the labor market has been and continues to be incredibly strong in america so which is Uh, good which is which has been particularly interesting given the immigration policy changes that have taken place over the last several years, uh, it'll be interesting going forward to see if we can get that service sector back because, you know, so many jobs, you know, when I, when I travel around me with people and, and the, the, the subject of the first job comes up, you know, what was your first job, you know, first big boy or big girl Offer it now. It throws up. Yeah. Level <laughs> a fry cook at McDonald's, and you know those those cat those move people into other jobs, and so to lose those jobs, I think is going to be, you know, would be very detrimental to the future of the housing, or I should say, the job market in general. Like into a newsletter writer, right? Could be fry cook to. Newsletter. I took a I took a wrong turn uh, early in my career. Uh, but that's that's a tale for a different time, Rich. <laughs> uh, what else out there? I got some MIT students that are trying to battle uh, uh, discrimination in mortgage through data. That was a story I found interesting this week. Uh, crypto mortgages starting to pop into the news a little bit more. I, I am on record firmly that that technology works so good with our industry. That's who knows how soon and we were talking about this five years ago, nothing to happen, but it, it's when, not if there. Um, some of the stuff we heard at our conference, uh, repurchased and review, file reviews up big time from Fannie and Freddie and, you know, some of the main aggregators. Uh, Robert, anything in there or anything you heard or talked about with uh, lenders at our conference last week that uh, caught your attention as being a new or emerging issue? Well, it's, you know, you touched on it earlier, you know, there's a lot of eyes and attention a year ago, no one was thinking that, you know, a lot of uh, folks didn't care about non-QM. When I went to the NBA back in October in San Diego, not one breakout session, it spoke about non-QM, not one. That, That shocked me that, you know, this segment, you talk about it and, you know, everyone knows it's there. They didn't give one room one breakout session to it so now there was a lot of interest you know what we had a nice you know session at, at at down in miami and a lot of people were you know looking to get into it coming back to it they did it pre you know covid now they're coming back they recognize you know the need for it it shouldn't be the tail wagging the dog but should really represent you know 25 to 30 percent of the business i think is a very healthy you know, product mix for any lender, any institution, any bank to offer non-QM products um, because there are self-employed, foreign nationals, you know, ITIN customers, you know, these are important products and, and, you know, getting people in the homes and providing that financing creates a more stable economy, creates more stable communities. I mean, the benefits just keep piling on that goes back to, you know, 1994 under the Community Reinvestment Act, you know, is build, you know, more people in homes is good for the country. So um, I, I like the work that we do. And, you know, and there was certainly a lot of interest in that. And we heard that too, Robert. And that's the part of why we wanted to bring you guys on as a partner. We had so many lenders that maybe they dipped their toe in the water non-QM before the pandemic, then it got too busy and, you know, became less of a priority for them. But we just heard a lot of demand really starting last late summer and going into the fall uh, from our members just about wanting to make sure they weren't missing opportunities, seeing the volume slow down coming up. What would be your, I guess, the biggest advice to 
just maybe that mortgage lender out there, and there's a bunch of them that maybe have dipped their toe in the non-QM waters, uh, but really haven't went out there and really tried to find the right secondary market partner and embraced it as a part of their business model? Well, the, the first thing is you, you, you got to change your expectations. It, this is an apples and oranges discussion, you know, non-QM. It, it's like having a Mac versus a, you know, a PC. You know, they're sure they're computers, but they run differently. They think differently. And you, you've got to learn the nuance and distinction with non-QM versus your traditional, you know, product. So if you start with that, if you, you know, if you come into it a little bit more humble, even though you've been doing this for 20 years and you've, you know, you're doing a billion dollars a year in, in conventional paper, non-QM is different. And if you start with that and you build and grow and, and listen and work with obviously the right partners, you know, then, you know, it becomes a good relationship. So you've got to kind of learn and retrain your staff and your expectations of that to understand there's this is a manual underwrite at the end of the day this is not something it's not a commodity it is a manual you know underwrite and you know it requires that so you've got to look at the big picture and if you do that you're going to have success and there's always solutions for that um, provided you know we do get to the ability to repay that is the biggest driver and the biggest fear in the non-QM space is making sure we do that. So we have a lot of checks and balances to make sure that we do that. Um, and that's, you know, if you can get to that point and understand that and realize there is a, you know, a difference in rate and, and go into it with that expectation and you, and you set the right level of expectation with the realtor and the borrower, you can have success. You can have wild success and you'll look like a hero because, you know, their, their bank, their community banks, you know, are doing some of these. But, you know, the big institutions, the Bank of America's are, are turning their nose up at them. So that's where you can be the hero. And I think that's where uh, I've said this before is non-QM is about providing solutions. And when you become a problem solver, you become very popular with your realtors, your referral sources to provide that solution. Very, very well said. And uh, some people calling you out in the chat, Robert, to uh, hope they want to see you at Maryland lacrosse games. So, inside uh, <laughs> uh, number Joe. one in the country, the Terps. Okay, there you go. All right, go Terps. So, uh, any any final four uh, predictions, Robert, uh, for us for uh, Saturday and Monday? I have two teams from my Calcutta in the final four. So, I I, I like North Carolina, but I think Kansas wins you know, wins the day. Kansas over Carolina. Mr. Crisman, uh, College Hoops, any uh, insight for us there? Is that still going on? We're in April. <laughs> it's March Madness, but typically the final four extends yeah. into I'm just, early. I'm, I'm, I'm just hoping at this point the Warriors make the playoffs. Yeah, Steph Curry uh, hobbled. That's not going to help uh, their chances. Phoenix versus somebody in the NBA Finals is what that tells me. So, but uh, yeah, looking forward to the final four this weekend though. Amazing. The Carolina and Duke have never played in the NCAA tournament. That, that is, and for that to happen in the final four in Coach K's final year, what a story. Uh, as was St. Peter's, really good tournament this year and looking forward to the action. The Nova Kansas game also should be great. So uh, I'll, I'll go with Duke over Nova in the final as my official prediction, but uh, we'll see what happens. Should be good. Rob, any uh, weekend plans of note uh, for you? I'll be playing basketball and playing tennis and doing some social activities. Looking forward to it. There you go. We won't pry into the social activity part of that. Robert, uh, any uh, weekend plans in the, the great state of Maryland for you? This is a uh, quiet. Uh, we're in between hockey season, uh, you know, so we have an end of the season uh, hockey party and you know, today we're going to have a celebration here in the office for a record quarter. So after we're done here, uh, I'm going to tip one to Rob uh, and you and uh, tomorrow our team at uh, ACC. So we're going to get the weekend started after this call. Nice. I got one more call at four o'clock. Unlike Mr. Crisman, I, I wait till my last call. The day is over before I start to get elbow deep into the uh, 
the uh, <laughs> Canada Giant. I, well, at least you poured it in a different can this week, Rob. So I like that. <laughs> so, on that note, um, as always, thank you to our attendees for. Uh, <laughs> that was a good here. one. That was a good one. <laughs> Every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern with the rundown and uh, Robert. Thank you again. Uh, always enjoy the conversation. And the best sound. Is there any better sound than the, the can opening? Oh, man. That, yeah. That's going to make it real hard to wait till that four o'clock call is over. But uh, so, but uh, Robert, thanks again. Thank you to ACC for being a great partner. You, great to see the connection starting to happen in Miami. We get to Chicago Absolutely. in September. It's going to be a lot more of that. And uh, looking forward to seeing it happen. So, but. Uh, all right. Until uh, next Friday, have a great weekend, everybody. And uh, Rob and Robert, thanks again. And uh, have a good one. Take care. All right.